let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. And uh, welcome to the 77th QCAM webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Aniket Mandal. Um, Aniket is a PhD candidate in theoretical chemistry at um, The Ohio State University. He's currently working in Professor John Herbert's group. Um, and he is working on developing um, advanced electronic structure methods for studying strongly correlated systems, um, specifically focusing a lot on like transition metal oxides. Uh, and he is working on applying DFT um, and other spectroscopy techniques to understand photochemical processes. He's been working a lot on novel approaches to DFT-based methods um, for excited state phenomena. And he actually recently implemented the DFT-CIS method in QCHEM. And he also developed a new parameterization that's specifically designed for studying X-ray spectroscopy, which he will be telling us a little bit about today. And uh, he's also been recognized many times for his accomplishments. Uh, he received the Best Poster Award um, at the uh, 2023 Midwest Theoretical Chemistry Conference and uh, also received uh, the Dow Graduate Student Symposium Award, Talk Award um, back in 2024. And he also did a summer internship at QCAM a couple of years ago. So um, we're really excited to have him back. And uh, Anikit, we're excited to have you here and um, very much looking forward to your webinar. So um, without any further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Oh, one thing I should mention before we go ahead and get started. Um, if you have any questions as we proceed with the talk, um, please post them in the chat down at the bottom and we will get around to answering those at the end. So um, sorry for the interruption. Thank you. Um, and Anikit, you can go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shannon, for the introduction. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Aniket, and um, I'm a student at The Ohio State University. Uh, and today, I'll be uh, talking about uh, DFT-CIS with applications to X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, this was work I, which I actually started at uh, when I spent uh, three months at QCAM uh, at the end of my third year. And so, yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was very beneficial for me, and yeah, so... So uh, I'll just go through the topics that I'll cover in today's webinar. So I'll give a brief introduction and I'll talk about how uh, uh, the different excited, the different singly uh, excited state methods. So CI configuration interaction singles, CI singles, and time dependent density functional theory. And also introduce a method that I implemented in QCAM, uh, DFT CIS. Uh, I'll go through the uh, the equations, the theory behind DFT-CIS and the two different implementations of it. And I'll also go through some results. So uh, I'll be focusing mostly on X-ray uh, spectroscopy results because that's um, what we are focusing on in today's webinar. But I will also uh, show some, uh, show, uh, show some uh, valence uh, results, valence excitation results, because I felt like those were uh, uh, necessary to explain uh, uh, or give some context to the theory that uh, we are going to discuss. And I'll, I'll also go through uh, the process of how to run DFT-CIS in QCAM. So in case you need to run it in the future, I will explain uh, 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 what inputs you need and what, what the output should look like. Uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, first I'll discuss, uh, I'll give a brief introduction. So the configuration uh, interaction singles method uses a Hartree-Fock wave function as a reference wave function on which it does uh, uh, excitations. However, since it uses a Hartree-Fock wave function, CI, CI singles does not account for electron correlation effects, uh, which is, which is, yeah, it's kind of a drawback because you, those, for certain systems, those effects play a major role. Uh, however, the use of a Hartree-Fock reference adds orbital relaxation effects, which, uh, as you'll see in the next few slides, uh, especially for X-ray spectroscopy, have a very important role in the accuracy of the method. Now, density functional theory uh, does account for dynamic correlation effects, uh, which comes from the exchange correlation functional that is uh, being used. However, uh, DFT lacks uh, orbital relaxation and also suffer, suffers from self-interaction errors. So uh, as you can see over here, uh, uh, the self-interaction and the lack of orbital relaxation are 
two ma major sources of error in TDDFT. And, uh, and this, this plays a big role in uh, when you're doing X-ray spectroscopy. However, self-interaction error in TDDFT can be countered by using a sufficient amount of exact or a sufficient amount of hydrogen fock exchange, which, mean, which uh, points towards the need for using hybrid functionals to do uh, X-ray spectroscopy using, uh, for, for TDDFT. So uh, yeah, I've talked a lot about uh, Hartree Fock exchange and uh, how it's important to uh, uh, in uh, to do X-ray spectroscopy. So I'll just go through the theory a little bit. So uh, linear response, uh, uh, the linear response TDDFT equation for excitation energies is, um, as you can see here over here, where you have the A and B matrices, which are the excitation and the excitation, and so and the, you get the excitation energies and as uh, as the eigenvalues in the omega. And um, X and Y are your excitation and de-excitation amplitudes. Now, what's the what is the form of these A and B matrices? So yeah, you we have these two uh, pretty big equations, which which is the uh, which is the form um, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, A and B matrices. Uh, but uh, we see the for hybrids, this uh, Hartree-Fock coefficient that is here, which determines the amount of uh, exact exchange, uh, which is come which comes from this integral. Uh, however, for uh, core excitations, the overlap between the occupied, uh, in this case I and J are the occupied orbitals, and A and B are the virtual orbitals. The overlap between the occupied and virtual orbitals are very small and can be neglected. So uh, if you neglect uh, uh, the overlap between these orbitals, the form of the A and B matrices becomes this, where the B matrix is essentially zero and the A matrix is, has a much more simplified form. Now, uh, the, this is basically, you're basically going to TDA, the Tam Dankov uh, approximation, where you essentially ignore the B matrix and the Y amplitudes. Uh, so in this equation, we see that the excitation energies are mostly dependent on the difference in the eigenvalue, the orbital energies of the occupied and virtual orbitals. However, for DFT, due to self-interaction error, these um, eigenvalue differences, where the energy differences between the occupied and virtual orbitals are uh, systematically underestimated. Uh, uh, but this can be countered by uh, you adding your uh, Hartree-Fock exchange which is uh, determined by your Hartree-Fock uh, coefficient. And hence, uh, the dependence on a functional to counter, uh, the, there's, a, there, there's a dependence on the amount of Hartree-Fock exchange that you're using to give you the best results. So uh, this can be seen in this uh, plot that I have over here, where you go from B30 lip, uh, uh, note that it's not B3 lip, it's B30 lip, it's just lip with 30% 30 30 Hartree-Fock exchange. And we systematically increase the amount of Hartree Fock exchange from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70. And here we see the gray bar is the uh, zero error bar. And you can see that the errors systematically decrease with the increase in Hartree Fock exchange. Now, this is because uh, self interaction error, which leads to the underestimation of the gap between the occupied and virtual orbitals. The, the, the addition of Hartree Fock exchange counteracts or cancels out the self interaction error. And uh, this is because uh, the addition of Hartree Fock exchange adds uh, orbital relaxation. Now, the accuracy of a particular function uh, thus depends uh, for X ray spectroscopy, thus depends on the amount of Hartree Fock exchange present. Now, this is very similar to what happens for uh, charge transfer excitation. So, the equation that I showed in the previous slide, uh, this is the same equation that is uh, that you get when you're investigating charge transfer excitations. So any functional which does well for charge transfer excitations will, uh, tends to do uh, well for, uh, tends to give you more accurate results for X-ray spectra as well. Now the accuracy thus becomes functional specific since it depends on the amount of Hartree fock exchange in the functional. Now I've used this, now I've begun using this term accuracy. Now accuracy in terms of excitation energies is relative. So. For valence excitations, anything less than 0.3, any, an error less than 0.3 EV is considered accurate. So any functional which gives you a mean absolute error for a certain system of less than 0.3 EV is said to be relatively accurate. 
for TDDF for uh, X-ray spectra, TDDFT needs shifts in the region of uh, 10 to uh, hundreds of EV. So it gives errors in the region of uh, anything from 10 EV to in the hundreds of EVs when it comes to core spectra. However, TDDFT does retain the accurate peak structure and splittings, so uh, uh, which is also desired for X-ray spectroscopy, as you can see in this figure, we compare uh, TDDFT using cam b 3 lip and DFT-CIS, and the difference between the two is 56 electron volts. This is for a, a, a chlorine system, and this is the chlorine K edge, and you can see that the spectra are uh, quite similar. It's just that it's, uh, it's uh, there's an offset of 56 EV, and that comes from the insufficient Hutchie-Fock exchange in cam b 3 lip so a method which reduces the shifts from hundreds of EVs to less than 10 at no extra cost, uh, extra computational cost is highly desired. So uh, St uh, Stefan Grimma and his group proposed the first iteration of this method of the DFTCIS method. So they combined the, uh, the, the combined DFTCIS uh, Hamiltonian matrix elements were shifted or semi-empirically corrected and the resultant methods account for a dynamic correlation coming from the density functionale along with some correlation uh, from CI singles. Um, so the, most of the correlation energy does come from the density functionale. Now, the, also the use of uh, cone sham eigenvalues leads to more accurate excitation energies. So this method was developed to be a, uh, uh, to give you more ac accurate valence excitations. However, uh, it, it could be extended to core excitations, but we uh, we thought that it would be necessary to reparameterize this method to extend it and to give you more accurate core excitations. So now 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 I'll discuss the theory behind uh, these two methods. And first, so I talked about how the DFTCIS Hamiltonian matrix elements were modified. So the modifications are essentially uh, the primary modification is the C1 parameter. Now the gap between the cone sham eigenvalues is much smaller than Hartree Fock. So if you're doing CI singles with DFT orbitals, you have to account for this smaller uh, difference in the eigenvalue energies. And that is accounted for by reducing the contribution from the K-like or the exchange term by a factor C1. Uh, there's also an exponential shift, which is added to the matrix elements uh, where this uh, delta J epsilon uh, parameter is this exponential shift. The 0.025 epsilon uh, correction, uh, so this entire correction was added to deal with states with small Coulomb integral values like Rydberg states. And this, uh, so the, the, the exponent, uh, exponential part does that. It adds, uh, it adds, it deals with states with small Coulomb integral values, whereas the 0.025 epsilon uh, correction was added to uh, uh, add consistency to the description of core excited states. And uh, for the purposes of uh, this talk and for the purposes of X-ray spectroscopy using b chilip CIS, this is the most important part. So for cam b chilip CIS, uh, we decided to add uh, two parameters, C1 and C2. So reducing the contribution from both the exchange and Coulomb terms. So it was seen from b 3 cis that the majority of the correction comes from the C1 parameter. Uh, and this is especially useful for valence uh, uh, excitation, uh, valence excit excitations, which the b 3 cis method was originally designed for. Now the exponential correction in b 3 cis was made to deal with charge transfer and Rydberg states. Using cam b 3 lip as the functionale, we already have a DFT method which can better account for charge transfer and Rydberg states. Uh, so we decided to not use the exponential correction that was there in b 3 lip cis Instead, we added a delta epsilon correction. Now this correction was added specifically to deal with, uh, to correct the core energy level values of cam b 3 lip cis of, cam, of the cam b 3 lip functionale. Uh, so, but this, these corrections are also uh, element specific. So we designed two separate uh, parameters. So for elements, uh, for which the 1s uh, orbital energy is less than 102 uh, Hartree's, which is essentially anything uh, uh, before argon. So up to, right up to argon, all the elements in the periodic table uh, have a 1s orbital energy less than 102 Hartree's. 
So and those elements use this correction, whereas for anything above argon, so specifically the 3D transition metals, which we were uh, focusing on, needs this correction. Uh, and this is the difference between uh, b 2 cis and cam b 2 cis is that cam b 2 and cam b 2 cis can deal with uh, 3D, the X-ray spectra of 3D transition metals much better and 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 gives you lower uh, errors for uh, uh, 3D transition metals. Uh, I'll discuss that more in the results section. Now, so on the, the delta epsilon parameter, so uh, Carter Fink uh, uh, at all in, in, the, in their paper have shown how uh, self-interaction error and orbital, uh, an orbital relaxation decide the accuracy of a functional, as you can see from this figure, from, which is taken from their paper, you can see that Hartree-Fock uh, only has uh, uh, orbital relaxation errors. So the blue bar over here is the orbital is the error coming from orbital relaxation, whereas the yellow bar or the orange bar is the particle hole self-interaction error, and the green dot is the overall error. So as you can see, Hartree-Fock, all the error comes from the orbital relaxation. Also for Hartree-Fock lip, this is, this is essentially um, blip with 100% Hartree-Fock exchange. Uh, there's no uh, self-interaction error. So uh, for these density functionals, however, you see that uh, there's a competing effect, which is the self-interaction error. So methods like SRC1 and uh, Becky half and half have uh, nearly equal amounts of self-interaction error and orbital relaxation error. So their overall error for uh, core excitation energies is very small. And this is primarily due to error cancellation. Uh, so and the delta epsilon parameter in uh, uh, cambi tulip CIS essentially balances the two competing effects and increases accuracy at no additional cost. Uh, also for uh, uh, X-ray spectra, to do X-ray spectroscopy, uh, we, had to uh, we had to use the core valence separation scheme, uh, which is already implemented in QCAM for TDFT. We also we extended that to uh, DFT CIS. Now CVS reduces the computational cost uh, by just uh, it just keeps it the occupied energy level necessary for your X-ray spectra and removes all the other occupied states. Uh, and this works only at the core level because the uh, the one S orbitals do not interact with the other occupieds that much, and you can just essentially ignore them. Uh, this also allows for the separation of spectra depending on the orbital of origin. So for K-edge, you use only 1s orbitals. For L-edge, you use only L, uh, 2s, 2p orbitals. For M-edge, you use only 3p, 3d orbitals. And so you can ignore all of the other occupieds, and thus it reduces the size of your configuration space by a huge amount. Uh, and, in, and so it allows, you, allows us to extend our method to uh, large systems and to do uh, for and to run calculations for a large number of routes, say 100 routes or 200 routes. Uh, so that would be impossible without the core valence separation scheme. And so that has been used extensively in all this work. Okay, so now uh, we've come to the result section. So first I'll discuss the X-ray spectroscopy uh, results. So I've spoken a lot about Hartree-Fock exchange and how that is important. Uh, over here, we see actual spectra. So this is theoretical spectra. Uh, the orange uh, spectra is b 2 lip cis cam and cam b 2 lip cis is the blue lines, whereas the uh, these two are constant for each of these four boxes. It's just the TDDFT spectra, which varies because of the... Uh, so say box A uses the SRC1 functional, which is a functional designed to give you experimental quality uh, TDDFT spectra, so which that is a benchmark. Uh, so you can see the pink curve and the blue curves and orange curves are very close, but they're not exactly at the same uh, uh, energy. There are, so the DFTCIS methods are off by two electron volts. Uh, this is the oxygen key edge for titanium dioxide. So the oxygen key edge peak is at 530 EV. Uh, and so you can see the beta lipcis is two EV off. Now in box B, we use the Becky half and half functional. And, and that you can see overlaps, nearly exactly overlaps with the B, the DFT-CIS methods. So 50% um, so Hartree-Fock exchange gives you uh, uh, good results as compared to uh, boxes C and D, which uses cam b tulip and b tulip functionality. You can't even see the edge because it's 
so both of these are off by 16 electron volts. And why these two functionals have uh, 20, uh, close 20% 20 Hartree-Fock exchange, whereas the Becky half and half functional has 50% Hartree-Fock exchange and the TDSRC1 roughly has 58%. So you can see how it's not that simple. Uh, TDSRC1 uh, and Cambi Chilip, the long range and short range um, Hartree Fock exchanges are uh, different, slightly more complicated than that. But still, effectively, you can see the effect of Hartree Fock on what the, heart, the increase in Hartree Fock exchange does to your X ray spectra. Um, so, the, yeah, and so B Chilip and Cambi Chilip both have large errors due to insufficient amount of Hartree Fock exchange and due to the self interaction error. Next, we uh, so then we did some benchmarking, and so we compared both of these methods, Cambridge-Lib CIS and Beach-Lib CIS, to the corresponding TDDFT methods using the same density functional, and we also compared it DFT to DFT MRCI. One more such uh, DFT MRCI is another such uh, combined density functional wave function method, but instead of CI singles, it uses MRCI as the wave function method, and uh, so it's it's much more uh, uh, accurate, uh, especially for uh, much more complicated systems and can get more, as uh, so it gets more static correlation, you get the static correlation from the MRCI. Uh, but for the case for the, for X-ray spectra, and especially in this case, where we benchmark errors in second row cage, excitation energies of 20 different molecules. So these are primarily uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen uh, K-edge energy values. You can see that TDDFT has an error of 12.5 to 12.6. So can be chilip has 12.5 EV error and can and, and B chilip has 12.6 EV, whereas DFT CIS has considerably less error. So can be chilip CIS has 3.86 uh, mean absolute error, and B chilip CIS has 3.15 mean absolute error, which is comparable to DFT MRCI. Uh, now, does this mean that DFT CIS is um, uh, equally accurate as DFT MRCI? Uh, no, but uh, it's close for this specific case. Um, so uh, for X-ray spectroscopy uh, of these uh, second row cage uh, elements or molecules, uh, DFT CIS and DFT MRCI give you comparable errors. Now, I talked about how we uh, Reparameterized can be chilip CIS, and there was one one big difference, and it came to how we treated the three D uh, transition metals. Uh, we can see the difference over here. So, uh, so this is uh, B chilip CIS, and the errors of B chilip CIS as compared to the best estimates, and this is the errors of a can be chilip CIS method as compared to the best estimates. Uh, so first, we uh, these are the third row elements: so silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. You can see that B chilip CIS uh, and can B chilip CIS, even though B chilip CIS is more than can B chilip CIS, it's not that great. It's not that um, that different. However, the errors explode for B chilip CIS when it comes to these metal complexes, so manganese, iron, nickel, and copper. So this this is primarily due to the parameterization of the core excited states, the correction. That is not that is not designed to deal with 3D uh, 1s orbital energies. So, which justifies the reparameterization uh, of Cambi to CIS, and that has allowed us to extend our calculations uh, to the 3D transition metal systems. Uh, so, with that, <laughs> we studied the effect of uh, cluster size on uh, this titanium dioxide uh, nanoclusters. So. We started from the monomer TiO2 and we went to the decamer titanium oxide dioxide uh, 10. So, so the this is the this is the Cambi Chilip CIS spectra. So the oxygen K edge spectra consists of two peaks, corresponding to the 3D of titanium. Uh, so T T T2G and Eg. Uh, the, the 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 two peaks are correspond to T2G and Eg MOs. So the intensity of these T2G and Eg peaks. Uh, get reversed with increase in cluster size. So as you can see uh, from, uh, so after TiO25, the intensities have been reversed and the peak structures appear to converge at titanium uh, dioxide, the, the heptamer. So we ran calculations up to the 13 mer, so TiO2 13. And 
the spectra did not change. So essentially the peak structure converged at titanium dioxide seven. And so we did not need, you don't need to do, at least for the K edge uh, of the oxygen, you don't need to do uh, the calculations of uh, clusters any larger than this uh, heptamer for titanium dioxide. So next we uh, studied the effects of basis set uh, in a Cambry Chilip CIS. So I discussed these C1, C2 parameters and all the, param the semi-empirical corrections. So for B chilip CIS, these corrections were uh, done uh, for the B chilip function using the B chilip functional and a specific basis set designed specifically for the B chilip CIS method. Now this restricts the applicability of this uh, method because it's uh, it's not a well, you have to use a specific basis set and a specific functional. Now, the Cambi Tulip CIS method was optimized using the parameterization was done using uh, the DEF2 TZVPD basis set. Now, so we investigated how the oxygen K edge spectra of titanium dioxide, uh, the decamer, uh, would vary according to uh, uh, three different basis sets. So, DEF2 TZVPD, DEF2 SVPD, and DEF2 SV parenthesis B. So progress, progressively smaller basis sets. Now, the DEF2 SV parenthesis P and DEF2 SVPD, the low accuracy basis sets, show a small two electron volt shift as compared to uh, DEF2 TZVPD, you know, which is the high accuracy basis set. However, on the other side, the use of the DEF2 SVP calculation is 23 times faster as compared to DEF2 TZVPD. So, in terms of raw numbers, the DEF2 SV parenthesis B took us two hours to run for a titanium decamer using a thousand roots to get the spectra, whereas DEF2 TZVPD for the same system, same number of roots took us 46 hours. So now you have to decide um, you know, which is more important to you, the time or the accuracy. It's a two EV shift, and when it comes to uh, spectra in the regime of 500 EV, a two EV loss of accuracy is is not that great a loss of accuracy as compared to your 23 times speed up. So yeah, so we can extend, we can use Cambi Chilip using DEF2 SV parenthesis P and we can extend this method Cambi Chilip CIS to large systems where we can ex investigate the X-ray spectra of large systems using a smaller basis set and not not lose accuracy that much. Next, we investigated uh, so these uh, organotitanium, the X-ray spectra of these organotitanium uh, molecules, so uh, ranging from TiCl4, and we progressively remove one chlorine ligand, and, and we add a cyclopentadienyl group to it. Uh, so it's TiCl4 and TiCl-CpCl3 and TiCp2Cl2. So um, these molecules have uh, uh, applicability as uh, drug molecules that have anti-cancer properties. So uh, we studied the uh, effect the addition of a, a cyclopentadienyl ligand has on the KH spectra of the titanium and chlorine uh, atoms. And we compared it to experimental work that has already been done. So for the titanium uh, K -ed spectra, we observed these features in the pre -ed. So uh, titanium uh, TiCl4 has a very bright uh, feature at the pre-edge, which decreases in intensity as we, uh, as we keep uh, removing the Cl uh, ligand and we add a cyclopentadienyl ligand. Now this also corresponds to the decrease in P contribution from uh, titanium while the D contribution stays the same. Now, why does this happen? So, so the TS1S to 3D transition is dipole forbidden. So, uh, so for, but due to 3D, to, 3D and 4P mixing, uh, this uh, transition is dipole allowed, and that is the extent that happens extensively for TiCl4. However, with the removal of a chlorine, an addition of a cyclopentadienyl, this 3D 4P, 4P mixing decreases, and you can see the effect in both the theoretical and X-ray spectra that for with each progressive addition of a cyclopentadienyl group, you can see that the intensity of the pre-edge feature has decreased. We see something similar for the chlorine K-edge, where 
once again, the chlorine pH feature decreases, the intensity decreases, and the percent con P contribution from chlorine decreases with increase in P contribution from the cyclopentad ionyl. Now, um, with the decrease in P contribution and from Cl and increase from cyclopentad ionyl, we see another feature arising, and that is the peak splitting. So the peak splitting changes with the addition of the cyclopentad ionyl ligand, and this is and also the there is no peak splitting in the pure uh, TiCl4 uh, molecule, but um, the intensity changes and the peak splitting essentially arises because the high energy d orbitals have higher contribution from Cp, uh, and this results in the splitting of the five d orbitals due to the addition and, and interaction with the cyclopentad ionyl ligand. We see this splitting appear in the titanium KH feature as well, and it's for the exact same reason because the uh, titanium 3D uh, orbitals are interacting with the cyclopentad ionyl group, and this interaction increases with addition of each cyclopentad ionyl group. And thus, th this is quite uh, useful to see how uh, you can explain a uh, bonding structure, um, what is happening in these molecules with uh, X-ray spectroscopy from the pre-edge features, and also how we can see that the Cambi Trilip CIS spectra match very closely with uh, the experimental spectra. You can, you can see similar features in both the experimental and theoretical peaks. Uh, and since both of these, uh, uh, and you need minimal shifts for uh, to get, uh, to match with experimental uh, spectra due to the parameterization of this method. Uh, next, we also investigated the strain effect on these diamondoid molecules. So adamantane, twistane, and cubane where the strain increases from adamantine to twistane with the maximum strain at the, between the carbon-carbon bonds uh, happening at the, the cubane entity. Now, uh, this is this is uh, TD can be, TDDFT using can be lip, and this is TDDFT using, uh, so this is DFT-CIS using can be lip. So with the increase in strain in the sigma, the, the sigma strain, uh, the sigma star resonance peak splits from broad to narrow features. So we can see at the lowest strain uh, entity, the, the resonance peak is quite broad. And so if the black uh, curve over here is the experimental spectra, and you can see that the broad spectra splits to narrow uh, intense features. Now the shifts needed to match with the experiment are 4 EV for Cambi Chilip CIS and 11 EV for TD Cambi Chilip. So this becomes important uh, in spectra like these, where there are lots of fine fine details and subtle uh, uh, peaks, and if you need a method by which you need to shift by 11 eV, it becomes very difficult to match with experiment. So, and so, uh, you can see how uh, a smaller shift is beneficial. Uh, however, both of these methods fail to describe the cubane uh, and narrow features. So, as you can see, there 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 are two features in the spectra. In the pre-edge uh, uh, pre-edge part of the spectra, however, the intensities are not the same. There is one more intense peak and one less intense peak. So that is not um, the same as what we, what we see in the experiment, where you have two equally or maybe one slightly more, but yeah, two equally intense narrow features. Uh, next, we uh, so all these. Results that I talked about before were was X-ray absorption spectra at the key edge. Uh, next, we we did some X-ray emission spectra using Cambi Chilip CIS, and we investigated uh, what shifts were needed to match with experiment. So these shifts, so these are H2S and CH3Cl. Now the shifts needed to match the theoretical spectra with experiment were larger than the shifts needed for XAS. So uh, for emission spectra, the shifts were larger. So for um, uh, X, in the X-ray emission spectra, the shifts for both of them, both of these were around 28 electron volts, whereas they're considerably smaller for X-ray absorption spectra, so around uh, six to eight electron volts. Um, we used uncontracted basis sets to see how, if they improved the results. Uh, that did improve the results marginally by about one electron volt, but didn't rectify the problem. Uh, so uh, I think so. We theorized that the problem was primarily coming from the parameterization of the method, which uh, was done on closed shell 1s orbital. And if you do XCS, you have a hole in the core, and so the 1s orbital energy changes. And so the the uh, 
the parameterization did not work as well for the X-ray emission spectra due to the presence of a core hole in your uh, reference system on which you do the excitations. Um, however, however, the shifts are still smaller than those needed for TDDFT. So for X-ray emission spectra with TDDFT, for these systems, for CH3CL, the shift was around 40 EV. So there's still less than what was needed for TDDFT. So it's still an improvement, but it's not as big an improvement as we have seen for uh, the X-ray absorption spectra. Now, next we, so this led us to think about how uh, can be chilip CIS would perform for the LH since um, it didn't perform as well for um, um, X-ray emission spectra. We thought maybe we should see what happens for X-ray absorption spectra, but at the L edge. So we compared uh, the CAM B-3-LIP CIS uh, spectra to TDDFT using B-3-LIP, and we compared the shifts needed for these. Now, both of these are non-relativistic uh, spectra, so without spin orbit coupling, it was just to see how the peaks compared um, with experiment. So in the TDDFT, uh, B-3-LIP peak was shifted by 10 EV and by 5 0.4 EV in this case for CICL4, whereas the CAMB to lip CIS spectra, you can see the shifts are still considerably smaller as compared to TDDFT. Now, the delta epsilon correction was parameterized using only 1s orbital uh, energy values. However, they were done using energy values. So that parameterization still works for orbital energies, uh, for orbitals uh, higher than 1s, uh, as we can see over here. So DFTCI still works for uh, the L edge uh, works equally well for both L edge and K edge and outperforms CDDFT in both the cases. Right, so I uh, discussed uh, X ray results up to now. Uh, now I'll discuss a few valence uh, excitation results. I felt that uh, I needed to discuss a few valence uh, excitation results just to give a little bit context on why certain parameters were used. Uh, so we investigated these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. These are systems where uh, TDDFT certain functionals tend to struggle. So for the one LA state, uh, we compared the <coughs> errors of these three methods. So uh, so TDDFT using LRC omega PBE, long range corrected omega PBE, and B chilip, and long range corrected omega PBH and B chilip CIS. So you can see that the lowest error is given by the long LRC omega PBH functional, which is expected as it's a functional. So this, these states have a significant charge transfer character. So yeah, it's a functional which gives the most accurate results because um, it's a functional which was designed to deal with these kinds of states. However, we see that B-chilip CIS is, uh, gives similar errors as compared to uh, and the LRC omega PBH. Uh, this is also, this is once again due to the parameterization of B3 lip CIS, which was specifically parameterized to deal with charge transfer and Rydberg states. B3 lip doesn't do that worse. However, LRC omega PBE does uh, significantly worse than these three methods. Uh, <clears throat> for the one LB state, however, we see that B3 lip is still quite accurate, whereas uh, B3 lip CIS. Uh, and the other two uh, long range character methods don't do that well. Um, uh, but yeah, so next we uh, investigated the uh, S1 state of these donor acceptor set of molecules. These molecules have significant charge transfer character in the first excited state. And we compare the errors of um, uh, two TDDFT methods and the CI singles. Uh, with B chilip CIS to just give so give some context as to how much improved uh, how much the improvement is as compared to CI singles and TDDFT. So for these specific systems, you can see that B chilip CIS is still considerably better than CI singles. Uh, also, is slightly better than TDDFT using B chilip and CAM B chilip. Now, this difference between CI singles and B chilip CIS is interesting because the major difference between these two methods is the fact that um, B-chilip CIS has dynamic correlation from the density functional. So the so I plotted the uh, mean absolute errors of these DA, donor acceptor moieties and compared them, uh, the, the, the first, excited uh, first excitation energies of these DA moieties and compared that to uh, CIS parenthesis D 
uh, excitation energies. Now, CIS parentheses D is, is essentially CI singles with a perturbative correction. Uh, so the parentheses D gives you the missing uh, correlation energy that's there in CI singles. So uh, as you can see that the difference in, uh, the, in the plots that the difference in energy is significant. So the mean absolute errors is 1.54 EV, whereas for b tulip CIS, it's one is 0.18 EV. Now, most of this uh, difference in errors is due to the uh, lack of correlation energies in CI singles. You can see that uh, the uh, b tulip CIS values match relatively well with the CIS parenthesis D method uh, method uh, results, whereas the CI singles values are off. And so around one or 1.1 EV of these, the difference in the error is due to the uh, <clears throat> missing correlation energy in CI singles, whereas b tulip CIS gets most of this missing correlation uh, energy by using uh, the DFT orbital, or in this case, the b tulip uh, functional. Uh, so there's no need for the use of perturbative D correction. We get values close to the CIS parenthesis D uh, results. Uh, yeah, so uh, so we discussed the theory. Um, we discussed the results, and now I'll just show you how to run uh, DFT CIS. So running a valence excitation energy calculation is uh, quite straightforward. It's like a uh, it's like any TDDFT job, except you need uh, just two uh, extra parameters. So you have to set DFT, DFT CIS equals true, and then you have to use uh, you, then you have to choose the DFT CIS uh, par params. So the parameters essentially. So in this case, it's one. So one stands for b tulip CIS. Now b tulip CIS specifically uses this basis set, so you need to use this basis set, or else you won't get the correct values. If you set it to zero, you will be just doing plain CI singles, but just using um, your density functional, so without any correction. If you set it to two, you'll be using uh, you'll be doing CAM B tulip CIS using the DEF two T ZVPD, or you can also use DEF two SVPD or SV parenthesis P. But for valence excitations, you can use the DEF two T ZVPD. Now your output will look something like this. Uh, you'll get a warning which tells you to use the specific functional basis sets that, that are necessary to, to run this job. And so the suggested basis sets are DEF2, TZVPD, or TZVP, and the suggested functionals are can b 3 lip or b 3 lip Now for our X-ray absorption uh, spectra uh, job, it's it's uh, very similar, in, but instead, uh, so, but you have to add your um, uh, CVS, uh, Correction scheme. So this is exactly the same as TDDFT. You set truncated subspace equals true. This is the TRN TRN SS uh, rem variable. You choose the truncation type to three, which essentially um, is a user defined truncation. So you uh, then all, you decide the number of active orbitals, and in the A list A list feature, you add uh, in the A list part of this uh, uh, input section, you add which active orbitals you want. And so all the orbitals, so in this case, I wanted the third and fourth orbitals. So all the occupied, uh, number of occupied uh, that are there in the uh, system are not considered. It's only the third and fourth occupied orbitals that are considered, everything else is not considered in the calculation. So this is what I was talking about when I said that you can vastly reduce your um, uh, OV space, your active space by using the CVS uh, scheme uh, and this allows us to do calculations using uh, DEF2 TZPD, but with 60 roots, which uh, for uh, big systems uh, is might be impossible to do with a base set like DEF2 TZPD. Uh, and so, yeah, so this allows us to do uh, use a large number of roots. Um, you can also do an X-ray emission spectra uh, calculation using uh, uh, DFT CIS. For that, you need to set up, so there are two parts of the job. You first need to um, get the neutral MOs. Uh, you need to run this single point calculation. And from there, you have to add a, a, a core hole and uh, in the uh, uh, 1S orbital, since we're doing K-edge. So then this is the, and then run a MOM calculation. So this is 
uh, the mom part of that calculation. So you have a core hole, hence it's positively charged, it's positively ionized. And then in the occupied section of this calculation, you specify where uh, the, which orbitals are occupied essentially. So one to nine for alpha uh, uh, electrons, they're all occupied, but for beta, for beta electrons, it's only two to nine, which are occupied. So the one uh, uh, beta position is unoccupied and that is the core hole. And we use the IMOM method to do this. And uh, yeah, so everything else is the same, STDFT, uh, except you have to set DFTCI is equals one or true, or, and then set your DFTCI as params. Um, and then you get your, uh, your results. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to summarize by saying that uh, DFTCIS uh, shows promising results for core excitations due to sufficient Hartree-Fock exchange um, and the way the parameterization was done uh, with errors close to DFT MRCI and significantly smaller than TDDFT. Um, the need for large shifts for core level spectra is dramatically reduced. Uh, this once again this is due to the parameterization which reduces your self-interaction error thus reducing the need for large shifts. Uh, DFTCIS uh, shows use as a cheap but accurate tool for core level and valence spectroscopy. Uh, this is because for core level spectra, we are countering the error coming from the self-interaction effects, uh, whereas for valence spectroscopy, we are um, countering the error for, that's there in CI singles uh, due to the lack of electron correlation, uh, which is due to the dynamic correlation that we're getting from the DFT orbitals. So it shows use as a cheap but accurate tool for core and valence spectroscopy. Uh, we're working on it adding a spin orbit coupling, which will enable the calculation of L and M at spectra, but with your um, uh, you get accurate um, spectra with spin, with spin orbit coupling and new splittings. Um, with that, I would like to thank my group, uh, my advisor, Dr. John Herbert, uh, QCAM uh, for <laughs> Uh, letting me implement uh, my uh, my theory in the software, the Ohio Supercomputer Center for running all my <laughs> calculations with a thousand roots, uh, which took <laughs> sorry, 46 hours, <laughs> uh, the ACS Petroleum Research Fund and the National Science Foundation for their funding, and the Ohio State University for, um, uh, for the office space and everything. Uh, uh, with that, I would like to thank you, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free. Awesome. Thank you so much for a great talk. Um, if anyone has uh, questions, uh, you can go ahead and post those in either the chat or the Q&A at the bottom. Um, Right. Um, we have uh, a first question, which is, uh, is this method applicable to, uh, or could this method be applicable to um, heavy elements and clusters, uh, such as like lanthanides, et cetera? Um, it'll still, yes, it is applicable to lanthanides, but... Um... It will give you errors less than TDDFT than uh, than um, so that less than TDDFT for lanthanides. Uh, so yeah, you can apply it to lanthanides and get better results as compared to TDDFT for lanthanides. But I would feel like uh, you still need shifts uh, for lanthanides because um, yeah, you still need shifts. You need to shift the spectra. So I I have a my own little follow up question to that, which is if would it be possible to reparameterize for lanthanides specifically. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So you, so yeah, we can uh, uh, reparameterize the method. So say as uh, parameterization for three D and four D, and then uh, parameterization specifically for lanthanides. So yeah, th th that flexibility is still there. You can still okay. do it so depending on what system you want to apply this method to. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, it looks like we've got uh, another question, which is. Um, why are you using a special basis set, or sorry, why are you using special basis sets for DFTCIS? How are they different? So uh, so the original parameterization, so by Stefan Grimma, 1996, 
uh, he used a special uh, basis set. So he used the TZVPD, TZVP basis set. Uh, so you have to remember back then, there weren't that many basis sets developed. So def, the DEF2, the Karlsruhe basis sets were not there at that time. So they, so since the method was designed to target Rydberg and charge transfer states, you needed specific basis sets which would deal with those states better. So since the, uh, so you basically added more diffuse function, diffuse functions and so uh, to deal with those uh, uh, states. So, and so that's why back then they needed a specific basis set to do the method. Right now we have a larger collection of basis sets to choose from and we don't need to do that. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and mark that one as answered. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, I guess if nobody else has anything, um, if anyone thinks of a question that they would like to ask later, um, there will be a forum topic posted um, directly after this webinar um, where, where you can post any follow-up questions. If you think of one like, you know, tomorrow or a week from now, and or if you're watching this on YouTube later, by the way, this will also be posted on YouTube probably within next week or so. Um, and so, uh, oh, there's another Q&A. Um, sorry, can you use scalar relativistic orbitals with this method? Uh, so, so like a scalar relativistic, uh, so yeah, you can do scalar, so all of these 3D metals need a scalar relativistic correction. So it's there in the paper, so we, uh, we have a table where we mention how much scalar relativistic shifts were added and all the errors that I've shown you for uh, especially the 3D transition metals are after you add a scalar relativistic shift to the spectra. So you still have that that big of an error. So yeah, you, uh, you, you have to add a scalar relativistic shift if that's not included in the method. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right. And... There we go. All right. Um, if no one else has any questions, um, like I said, you're welcome to post things on the forum. Um, and oh, okay. Sorry. We have another question. <laughs> I should give people a little more bandwidth to ask questions, I guess. Um, have you tried similar calculations using Psi4 is the, the follow-up question, I guess, or not a follow-up, but a new question that is its own separate entity? Uh, no. Uh, so I don't know if Psi4 has a DFTCIS implementation. So yeah. So, so um, I implemented it in, in QCAM, so I ran it on QCAM. I was going to say, yeah, uh, Anik had, had to build this implementation himself in QCAM yeah. from scratch, basically. Yeah. Um, and so I I also actually don't know if Sci4 has this implementation of, of DFT CIS stuff. No, I know Orca has a variant called DFT ROCIS, which does, uh, instead of, uh, it does ROCIS, but using DFT orbitals. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if Sci4 has an implementation. And I'm also pretty sure that um, if Sci4 does have a DFT CIS implementation, they probably don't have your parameterization. Yeah, yeah. So they don't have the, yeah. So this paper talks about the new parameterization that we have done, and that is implemented only in QCAM. And the, I implemented that, and I implemented the original implementation as well. And that is available only in QCAM. This is like a QCHEM specific implementation. Um, although, again, that, that parameterization is available in the literature if someone wants to implement it in Sci4. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, does anyone else have any additional questions that they want to ask? I'll give it 10 seconds or so. <laughs> okay, awesome. If there are no other questions, um, thank you so much, Anakit, for a really awesome webinar. Um, it's, you know, it's been really cool to see what you've done with all of this since your internship at QChem. Um, and we're really excited for you as you're kind of, you know, wrapping up this work at the end of your PhD and uh, going on to some really awesome things. So we're looking forward to seeing what you do in the future. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, have an awesome rest of your Thursday, everyone. Take care. Bye.